As the world closes in on 5 million confirmed cases of corona and nearly a third of a million deaths, well, it's time to talk about that other part of the balancing act, which is the economy, which unfortunately for the powers that be in the United States and several other Western countries, the economy is conflated with the idea of a rising stock market. And uh, that's why we're titling this one, Brr, that's the sound of the printing press of the Federal Reserve running in overdrive. It's smoking away. Hello, everyone. This is Dr. Chris Martinson here with your daily update. Monday, May 18th, 2020, day 116 of the overall reporting. And after a long weekend, uh, I just have to ask, did you miss me? Uh, no, just kidding. He has a PhD in psychopathology. Totally different thing. Let's move on first to a suggestion of the day. Liked this one a lot. Uh, it started out, hello, Chris. Uh, it was a long time before I hit sub sub subscribe on any YouTube channel. The reason was I didn't see any benefit to it. I don't need notifications. Google search algorithms do that for me. Most channels told me to subscribe without explaining how much a subscription cost. Nothing. Or what came with it. Nothing. Since I didn't know what a subscription was, I didn't subscribe nowadays. When I do subscribe to a channel, I do it to support the channels that are being demonetized or censored in other ways because their content is focused on truth rather than advertising. And by the way, our, our uh, channel here got completely demonetized. I've been doing all of this uh, virtually free, um, virtually because I think every so often on a premiere, there's a couple of ads that might run for Epoch Times or something like that, but it's, it's literally... Uh, pocket change compared to um, uh, what would have come if this channel had been monetized. Uh, Greg continues here. I suggest you appeal for support this way. Just tell them, uh, you, the listeners here, it benefits you and America. You might say, because we're focused on telling the truth rather than collecting advertising revenues, the best way for you to support this channel is by clicking like or subscribe. That makes YouTube recommend our channel to new viewers more often. Don't worry about the notification bell unless you want YouTube to clock your email, clog up your email. Besides, YouTube search algorithms will recommend our latest content to you automatically. You subscribe to keep us on the air and help get our message out. Nothing will change at your end, except YouTube might recommend our latest videos more often. Sincerely, Greg. Hey, thanks a lot for that, Greg. Really appreciate uh, putting it out so cleanly and thought I'd just read your words rather than make up my own. Yes, if you could just subscribe to this channel and also hit like, that really does help get our message to more people. And I think this message needs to get out to more people. Listen, if, if this was a political party, what would we call it? The common sense party, uh, the party of people who can uh, and enjoy uh, actually having real context and uh, full uh, rich textures to their conversations? Is this the party of people who are simply curious and not rigid in their belief structures? Is this the party that has integrity? Um, yeah, it's all of those things. So at any rate, let's move on now. I got a big story for you today. We are closing in on that 5 million number here worldwide. We're probably way over that because some countries such as Iran and uh, Bolivia, sorry, Brazil, uh, very, very uh, heavily undercounting their cases, which is to say nothing at China, right, who I believe undercounted their cases by a factor of 10 Plus, those are just confirmed cases. Of course, there's probably 10 times that many cases uh, of people who have had it but haven't been tested and confirmed. Closing in on a third of a million deaths here, a very, very sad statistic. And when we look at the world's numbers here, and let me get rid of this thing right here. Uh, what I did was I pulled the numbers from the Worldometers slash coronavirus page, and I reorganized them so that they went from deaths per 1 million of population from a high of 781 three here on the 500s, then one in the 400s, three in the 300s, a couple in the 200s, three in the 100s, and then randomly on so forth down to 50, where I cut this off. Belgium, in the number one spot, uh, articles coming out saying that Belgium is there because of how they're counting. They're including uh, probable COVID diagnoses of people who die in nursing homes. Many of the countries on this list uh, did not include um, people who died outside of their hospitals in their COVID deaths. People think uh, that, I don't know, that, that uh, COVID deaths are overcounted and some say they're undercounted and, and Belgium being so far at the top of this list, far and away having the worst outcome here, they say it's because they're actually counting in a, a much more realistic way than other folks. Uh, as well, we might note here that number six on the list, Sweden, a lot of people say in Sweden has the gold standard approach they would like to see carried out. Uh, and of course, Sweden's 
economy has been hit pretty hard. And they do have greater freedoms and openness and people are allowed to um, walk around and, and make their own decisions. But I got I to gotta confess, the Swedish culture is much more um, able to handle this sort of a virus because of this uh, social distancing that's culturally built in. But the level of responsibility towards each other that's built in gives Sweden a very different – allows Sweden to pursue different opportunities and options that I think other countries are less able to pursue in this particular story. Uh, United States closing in on 100,000 total deaths. And again, if you put all those people in a stadium, that's a pretty big crowd. And uh, it's a very unfortunate statistic here. I did mention Brazil. They're coming up really fast. Uh, I think their total deaths are probably undercounted by a factor of two at least uh, based on crematoria operating, based on uh, satellite views of, of mass graves being dug, things like that all suggest that Brazil's having a very tough run of it. And of course, they have lots of the favelas, the very poor slum-like areas on the outsides of their large cities, which are just perfect breeding grounds for something like uh, coronavirus to spread. And of course, when we see things like uh, Brazil on there, we understand that maybe a summer lull really isn't in the cards. All right. But today I really have to talk about um, the Federal Reserve and all of the stuff that's being done in the United States, which mirrors things being done in other countries. And um, here's here's what I, I need to talk about. First, it begins. The story begins like this. The distribution of family wealth is not evenly distributed. If you had a perfectly egalitarian society, you might say the line would look like this, a nice straight line. If I could draw a straight line by hand, that's what it would look like. Um, but instead, what we see is that uh, at the 50th percentile, there's practically no wealth on this side of the line. And as you go this way, you recognize the shape of this curve now, don't you? Right? This is a nonlinear curve. This looks like an exponentially increasing uh, amount of wealth that goes whoosh, like that um, as you turn the corner and head into that super steep phase. And it just shows that the uh, wealth is really, really heavily, uh, unfairly distributed, if you want to look at it that way, um, uh, not equally distributed, if you want to look at it that way. Whatever your language is, it turns out that uh, the Federal Reserve is now in the business of picking winners and losers. So when we look at um, the top 10% of households, 84% of all stocks directly or indirectly owned by just the top 10%. The whole bottom of the 90% has just a a 16th, a one eighth exposure. So this is uh, seven eighths down here, one eighth up here. And when you look at non home and non home real estate, so all the big commercial stuff, same thing, about 84% of that's owned out there. And business equity, a little over 90% of that uh, is actually owned by the top 10%. So not, no surprise, but the top 10% are very much uh, concentrated owners of stocks and uh, the equities out there, which means that when we see things like the NASDAQ today up huge again, up really big here, and it's just been going like just powering like this to the point where it is now much higher than it was even at the beginning of the year, which is right here, and much higher than it was a year ago. So this is the NASDAQ 100, and so that includes all of the high-tech stock shares mostly and things like that. So how can you make a case? How, what sort of case would you make that stocks are worth more than they were a year ago in the United States? Now, here's the thing. What a stock, is, as it's told to us, the narrative in the United States is that stocks represent a forward-looking discounting machine that is assessing the possibility of future cash flows coming out of a company. That's the story. So if you decode that a little bit, it says when stocks are doing well, it means the economy is either doing well or about to do well. You can't make that case here today. You want to know why stocks are going up? One thing and one thing only. We got to turn now uh, to that thing. And this is uh, Jay Powell, who is the chairman of the Federal Reserve. We're going to turn to his recent media appearance. All right, let's turn now to Jay Powell in his uh, media appearance and see where that gets us. Oh, wait. I'm not, I don't think this is a 60 Minutes appearance. Hold on. This isn't the one I was looking for, but this is close. Uh, is this it? No, no. No, no. It's a different one. It's this one. That's right. Let's turn to this one now. Here's Jay Powell, chairman of the Federal Reserve, explaining a very important function for everyone. Simply flooded the system with money. Yes, we did. 
That's another way to think about it. Another way to think about it. Where does it come from? Hmm. Do you just print it? We print it digitally. So we, you know, we, as a central bank, we have the ability to create money uh, digitally. And we do that by buying treasury bills or, or bonds or other government guaranteed securities. And that, that actually increases the money supply. We also print actual currency and we distribute that through the Federal Reserve Banks. Simply flooded the system with money. Yes, we did. That's another way to think about it. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's that's uh, that's the only way to think about it. So here's what the Federal Reserve has been doing. They have been uh, flooding the world with money. And where does that money go? Well, it goes into into the stock market, of course. And so this is where the Federal Reserve really started printing like crazy. And of course, they're driving up the price is not just of stocks, which I'm showing here, but also of bonds. Those mortgage-backed securities that Jerry Powell just mentioned that the Federal Reserve is buying are now worth more on a on a per unit basis than they were before this crisis started. How is that possible? Do you know how many mortgages are about to go uh, into foreclosure? These bonds should be trading at a vast discount, which is to say on sale, which is to say at losses compared to where they used to be. So all of the super wealthy entities and uh, hedge funds and private equity and family offices and endowments that that own these things, instead of them taking the losses, the Federal Reserve has uh, decided to take those losses. And as Jay Powell said, um, other assets guaranteed by the U.S. government, which the U.S. government can't guarantee anything. That means the taxpayers. Uh, so what he's really saying is we decided to take the inevitable losses that are going to be coming on these mortgage-backed securities and make sure that those losses are borne by the taxpayers, not the people who bought them. So if you buy a stock and it goes down in price and you lose money on that when you sell it, nobody comes to your rescue and says, here, let me make you whole, not just whole, let me give you more money than that stock was worth when you bought it because you know what? We think that's important. That's what this man has been doing. And that's what the Federal Reserve is really up to is they are printing money. The printer goes, brrr, right? Here we are. This is the world that we live in now. It looks a lot like this. We've just got massive amounts of money just being printed like crazy. And it goes into the stock market. And then the wealthy get wealthier. And this chart gets even steeper as things go on. And by the way, this chart's a little bit old. I will be very surprised if we haven't already moved this, uh, this 50th percentile isn't already in the red. And that I'm going to bet, see, it crosses here at, at, um, at this mark right here is where it goes below zero. I'm going to bet it goes below zero here. But this part is going to be way up here sometime at some point in the future. OK. All right. So that's how that all works. And by the way, uh, we temporarily changed our name over at Twitter to peakbrosity.com. Uh, and so I said here in uh, honor of... The magnificent Leave No Billionaire Behind program of Adfield Reserve, we've temporarily changed our display name. This is something I really want to bring up here, somebody writing back in response to that. As a 25-year-old, it's pretty demoralizing and rage-invoking, okay? Um, and so uh, that swashbuckling pirate here uh, writing that. Yeah, it is pretty demoralizing and rage-invoking. It's demoralizing because these people who are... Um, who are sorry that's that's uh every time it shifts out of frame like that that's uh, microsoft office insisting that i have to sign in even though i've already just signed in uh it's just infuriating sometimes um this is rage and joke in, in, inducing because the people who already own all the assets like stocks and bonds and things like that they are not um earning the new trillions of dollars that have suddenly come their way because the federal reserve is printing money and pouring it into their assets they didn't do anything to earn that Whereas if you're a 25-year-old, you're expected you're going to have to earn your way out of the fact that you might have to go into, you know, maybe get into a lot of student debt just to be able to play the game. You're going to have to work hard. You may never get out from under that crushing level of, of debt indebtedness. And so it, it's demoralizing and rage invoking, demoralizing because you feel powerless, rage invoking because it's totally unfair. I totally get it, swashbuckling pirate. Your emotions are both correct and deserved. All right. Let's look at stocks, though, in the context of this, uh, in, in the context of GDP. This is a a uh, gross domestic product, of course, GDP. This is the Atlanta Fed has a tool called GDP Now, and they're trying to estimate real GDP. So even the range of the top 10 and bottom 10 average forecast from a bunch of blue chip consensus economists says averages out to about minus 32%. Get out of here. 
uh, Microsoft. All right. And the Atlanta Fed GDP now estimate is cranking out here at minus 42%. That's a minus 42% decline in the economy. And it's supported by a lot of other data. We got ugly data like U.S. retail sales. Look at this. So uh, real retail sales, um, excluding building materials here, and then consumption expenditures. This comes out a little bit later. So these two track each other. Look at this reading for April over here. This is down 22% here. It's just crazy, right? Um, and then this is going to come down a lot as well. Or how about uh, Cathay Pacific is a uh, uh, airliner at the travels out of uh, Hong Kong. And look at this. They carry an average of 458 passengers per day in April. Only expects 500 in May. That's an insane 99.6% drop from the same month last year. Oof, right down to zero, right? Uh, so what does the Federal Reserve do? Well, they print. They just print and then they're going to print some more. So um, Jesus, what is wrong with Microsoft? It's such a pain. All right. Uh, now we're going to turn to, let's look at it, this at the local level. So here is the mayor of Ithaca, New York, talking about what happens if they have got two colleges there, Ithaca uh, College and also Cornell University. What happens if the students stay home? They're already in trouble, but let's listen in to the mayor uh, respond to this question. Mr. Mayor, it's Sarah. Have you done any work on what type of financial hole that would put you in if, if those two universities yeah. don't open and what you would need? Yeah, it's about the, uh, yes, that's been um, the cause of many sleepless nights over the last two months. I mean, again, we went from um, the largest, you know, I took I took office at the height of the Great Recession, right? I was first elected 13 years ago, and I uh, closed a budget deficit that was $3.5 million large. That was the largest budget deficit in the city's history. We worked really hard to close that. We're now facing a budget deficit of $15 million, right? five times the size of the largest we've ever had. Uh, and that assumes, honestly, that budget deficit assumes that the students are coming back in the fall. The students don't come back in the fall. We're in real, I mean, uh, cataclysmic trouble. This is why the bill that the, the House Democrats passed last Friday, a tremendous bill that would have helped us, because we're in a finger trap here right now, right? Uh, I mean, we can't reopen the economy um, in this economy, right? We can't reopen this economy if... We don't have, as we've had to do, furlough a quarter of our employees. We've had to close down our youth services. Uh, how are people going to go back to work if they have no place to drop their kids off before their shift starts? So that's why we need the federal government to get the engine running first uh, with more stimulus. Frankly, if they feel like, as the, as the Senate Republicans seem to feel like, they've done enough stimulus, then they are not uh, paying attention to Main Street. All they have to do is come down to Ithaca stand on a street corner and ask themselves, does this seem like a stimulated economy to you? Yeah, let's look at So this is happening all over the place. And so I, I just pulled up this one um, example because the level of uh, tax shortfalls across states, municipalities, and maybe maybe Ithaca, New York can just sort of serve as a, as a warning bell on this whole thing. So as the Federal Reserve is printing money and buying assets uh, from rich people so that rich people can get richer, it's doing absolutely nothing to help uh, the situation that's going on in, in uh, we'll call it Main Street all across America. And it's creating an extraordinary gap between the haves and the have nots, uh, between those who make the policies and benefit from them and everybody else. And it's getting it's getting really um, <clears throat> it's getting really quite problematic. And by that, I mean, uh, this could end pretty badly uh, with a crash that's worse than anything I could have expected, of course. Uh, you know, honestly, the Federal Reserve is trapped. They made a bunch of errors starting back in the mid 90s. They made they can double down on those errors around 2001. Then they tripled down on those errors coming in after the housing bubble. And now they're quadrupling down on those same errors. So so if you follow the arc of that story, uh, there was a little, little hiccup in 1994. It led to a giant hiccup in 1998, which led to a crash in 2000, which led to an even larger crash in 2008, which is now going to lead to an even bigger crash um, following all of this nonsense. And of course, why? You can't print your way to prosperity. You can drive up asset prices and you can, uh, you know, cram all the wealth into a few families and you can make the NASDAQ go higher and you can print money like crazy. But you know what you can't do? You can't uh, fix this with with just pure printing like that, and you can't fix what's going on in Ithaca or across uh, places uh, like that. So, as uh, Sven Henrik put it, he said, "Don't fight the Fed." Uh, really means paying a premium 
for assets that otherwise wouldn't carry that premium. So that's a fancy way of saying the Fed is going to force you to pay more for a mortgage-backed security that otherwise would probably be getting sold at a heavy discount. No serious person can claim markets would be trading anywhere at these levels were it not for the interventions of a central planning committee. How's that capitalism? Well, that is a great question. Uh, it's not a capitalism at all. So it's really, it's just, this is just print, 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 print. And by the way, I'm bring, raising all this stuff about the Federal Reserve um, because if you don't understand what's going on with the Federal Reserve, it's this is going to be the largest single thing to shape your future. And it's going to shape the amount of inflation we have. It's going to, the, what opportunities come, which ones are destroyed. We shouldn't be here in this first place. We should not have these difficulties that we have in the first place. We shouldn't have inflated and reinflated and triple reinflated bubbles. We should have learned our lesson in 1998. Didn't learn it. Should have learned it in 2000. Didn't learn it. Should have learned it for sure in 2007, 8. Didn't learn it. Are we going to learn it this time? Well, I really hope so. But the possibility of a cataclysm here is really, really large. So we recently uh, held a uh, a seminar, a webinar over at Peak Prosperity, and we had some of my favorite people on there. I'm on there, of course. Grant Williams, uh, one of my favorite people. Mike Maloney, what a solid thinker. Charles Hugh Smith, great guy and solid thinker, all moderated by Adam Taggart. Here's just a tiny piece of it. You can get to it at this link right here. Here's uh, some of what's on that. This is from a trailer for it. One in five of the workforce in America has lost their job in the last six weeks, and the market has gone up. We've had unemployment jump to 14.7% from 3.5%, and the market has gone up. We've seen consumer credit and consumer spending collapse to all-time lows, and the market has gone up. Every emergency effort to save the system makes it more fragile. More fragile. That's exactly right. That was Charles Hugh Smith there at the end. Uh, so we really watch that. It's, it's really, we got great feedback from it so far. These are some of my all-time favorite people right here and, and loved being on a, on a moderated panel with them all. Here's why everyone should care about this. There's the reason. We shouldn't abdicate. Oh, that's big monetary policy. I can't weigh in on that. I'm powerless. Why? You know, this used to be a, a, a something that people talked about and debated and ordinary citizens had a very, very large say in because, of course, it affects your lives enormously. And Plutarch, many, many, many years ago, a few thousand, said... An imbalance between rich and poor is the oldest and most fatal ailment of all republics. And that's exactly where we're heading. And we're doing that really without much of a conversation. So that's what I want to have. I want to have that conversation. I think it's within our right. It's within our obligation set. It's our responsibility to know about these things and to talk about them. Um, because let's just run some math on how this all works. Remember I said 84% of uh, all stocks are owned by the top 10%. Honestly, uh, it's something ridiculous, like 40% of the total is owned by the top 0.1%. So it's not even the top 10%. Is that there's massive, massive hyper-concentration of the wealth in the very, very top of the structure, which we can see in the steepness of all this. Okay, thank you, Microsoft, for continuing to bug me. You're just amazing at that. Um, and uh, so let's run some math. Here's some math. So right now, um, the total market cap of the Wilshire total market, so that's five, that's a universe, 5,000 stocks, is nearly $30 trillion at 29.93. Um, I can argue the GDP is not actually that, uh, that's what, that's its last reading, but trust me, it's a fraction of that right now. But here's some math we're going to run. So that's what it is today. Roughly a year ago, um, this is what it was. I tried to get exactly a year ago, but I couldn't find the, I couldn't, scroll back in this and get the exact uh, readout. But here it is. A year ago, GDP was 21.34. And uh, this was about a trillion and a half dollars less um, at uh, 28.37. So total value of all the universe of stocks a year ago was 28.37 trillion. Now today it's 29.93 trillion. Stocks are worth more. Well, back in May of 2019, stock owners had uh, stocks that were worth 132% of GDP, okay? So that was their total ownership. And so they had stocks, by the way, that's super duper bubble territory. You could make a strong argument that says, how could how could the stock of uh, companies be worth more than the overall economy itself? It's kind of a, anyway, leaving that aside, that was the proportional ownership. Well, let's cast forward a year. Now in 2020, stock owners have, their ownership is 139% 
of stated GDP, but what if GDP isn't quite that high? What if it's a little less than that? What if it's uh, 20% less than that? Well, then their total ownership now is 174% of GDP with a 20% GDP drop, but that might not be enough. Didn't, aren't we looking at maybe a 40% drop? Well, let's just, let's go just to 30%. At a 30% drop, stock owners have 199% of GDP. Do you see their ownership of the country is increasing massively? So while 40% of people are out of work, the wealthiest of the wealthy are finding their share of the ownership of the United States is just exploding. They own more of what GDP remains than they did before this crisis happened on a ownership basis there's this has been a fantastic crisis for the super wealthy and you know who the number one defender of the super wealthy is it's this man right here explaining yeah you know yeah where, where do we get all the money that we use to push out into the stock market so that rich people can get you know get a lot of get higher ownerships and stuff yeah we we just print it yeah well not print it print it we just click some buttons on a computer and and uh, we create more we create more wealth uh, more money, more currency out of thin air. And, uh, and it goes into the stock market. And next thing you know, the owners of the stocks have a bigger proportional ownership of the overall economy. You push this far enough and eventually one entity owns literally everything. Right now, the Federal Reserve is the largest landlord in the United States by owning all those mortgage-backed securities that have bought how? By clicking some keys on a keyboard and picking them up at uh, above market prices. But it doesn't matter to them because they just make money out of thin air. They don't actually really care. If they take losses on those, uh, you know who pays for that? Uh, that would be the uh, taxpayers of the United States. So they can't really lose. They print money out of thin air. And uh, if they do accidentally lose some money, the taxpayer makes them whole on that. So uh, what do they care? Because you know what? The Federal Reserve is really staffed with people who earn a lot of money and they go to the right parties and they mostly hang out with people, let's say, mm, probably very preferentially on this side of the line. And that's their whole universe of people that they talk with and understand and all of that. So, so of course, you know, they may not totally... They might have lost a little touch, uh, not just with Main Street, but I think with the larger arc of the story, which is that fairness is important, but really this, that an imbalance between rich and poor is the oldest and most fatal ailment of all republics. That's something that the Federal Reserve seems to have completely forgotten about. And that's why we have now 25-year-olds saying it's demoralizing, a little bit rage-invoking, right? I absolutely agree with that. Let's go a little bit further. Um, this person, Kofo, writing here uh, yesterday on Twitter says, poor people, stop it. Poor people are going to exit lockdown with higher transportation costs, rent they have to pay back, an education system that's totally fucked their kids, and no transport for said kids who could barely afford to eat in the first place. And that's before austerity sets in for another decade. Uh, it's continuing on with that. The wealthy will come out to a more flexible work lifestyle, greater income and transport infrastructure that will prioritize them, make the city more accessible for them, more hostile to the undesirables who kept the city running at a cost to their lives in this pandemic. And this person writes, that's why we need a revolution quick. And that's exactly what happens. You do get to revolutions. Why? Because it's those sorts of imbalances, that lack of justice and fairness that ultimately leads to um, revolutions, be those where people revolt by not paying their mortgages or rents, by people revolt by not buying things anymore, people revolt actually sometimes with pitchforks. It all depends, right? This is a really important concept right here. This concept is wicked important. And I'm a little disappointed that we are not having any open conversations about this dynamic and that the Federal Reserve goes on a big national thing like 60 Minutes and is asked softball question after softball question without being pressed on this, which is, hey, Jerome Powell, you are creating a massive imbalance between the rich and the poor. That's a bad idea. What are you doing? And I think it would have been great if he answered that. And by the way, people are starting to notice this. I mean, uh, over in the UK, they noted that low paid, low paid workers are more likely to die from COVID-19 than higher earners. Look at this. Men, particularly in low skilled jobs, are four times more likely to die from the virus than men in professional occupations. While women working as carers are twice as likely to die as those in professional and technical roles. 
And in the United States, they say essential workers are dying. America's underclass becoming more visible in the coronavirus crisis uh, from April 2nd. This whole idea of essential workers, we got to replace that. They're actually sacrificial workers. That's the correct word that we should be using here at this time. So um, that's absolutely, uh, absolutely the case. And so I'm going to have to put it this way. The Federal Reserve is utterly lacking integrity. They are ideologically rigid. And what's their ideology? Well, they believe in all their crazy, stupid uh, formulas about how Taylor's rule this and monetary policy that. And they don't have the intellectual uh, flexibility, the integrity to lift their heads and go, wow. We've been doing something for 12 years now, which has only made the rich get richer. It's been a little bit unfair. They've mostly been getting rich by using money to make money. That's financialization. Financialization is the art of making money with money. What they've been doing, though, is uh, preferentially rewarding some at the expense of others. And that's just how the system works because the Fed doesn't create wealth. It you know, prints money out of thin air. That's true. But that's not the same thing as creating wealth out of thin air. Wealth is is real people doing real things and performing real services and adding real value. That's where wealth comes from. Money is just a marker we use to sort of exchange that and, and note who, who has how much of it, right? So money is a, uh, it's a social contract. Well, the Fed is violating that social contract. They're picking winners, and those are the ultra-wealthy. They're picking losers. That's everybody else. They are stealing from the future, right? All this money's got to be paid back. Like, oh, we, we, we only invest in assets that are secured by the government. What a bunch of blah. Come on, 60 Minutes. What does that mean? They're not buying assets. They're buying debt instruments, right? They're buying treasury securities and mortgage-backed securities. They're buying debt instruments. That's a far cry from what I would call an asset in the first place because an asset is something that produces – real value over time, right? So these are debt instruments, which might have assets on the back end, but they're buying debt instruments that are backed up by the full faith and credit of the United States government, which means the taxpayer. And they're also buying them at above fair market rates, which means they are guaranteed to lose money on those things. Who's guaranteed to lose money on those things? That's right, the taxpayers. Which taxpayers? Taxpayers from the future. Oh, so in order to make sure that the ultra-wealthy can say sell their assets to the Federal Reserve today at above market rates where the Federal Reserve is ready, willing, and able to throw the future generations under the bus. That's what's happening here. This is what Jerome Powell is actually saying. So let's listen to this one more time with that, with that decoding in place, okay? Because this is really astonishing. Simply flooded the system with money. Yes, we did. That's another way to think about it. We did. Where does it come from? Do you just print it? We print it digitally. So we, you know, we as a central bank, we have the ability to create money uh, digitally. And we do that by buying treasury bills or, or bonds or other government guaranteed securities. And that, that actually increases the money supply. We also print actual currency and we distribute that through the Federal Reserve Banks. Simply flooded the system with money. Yes, we did. That's another way to think about it. It's the only way to think about it. They flooded the system with money so that stocks could go up in price, so that they could buy bonds from rich people and entities uh, for more than they were actually worth, so that the top 10%, or more specifically, the top 0.1% of, uh, the, of the nation's uh, wealthy families could remain that way. And they did that even though... GDP is down a stunning 42% by this measure, even though it's leading to a really demoralizing and rage and sense among people who are younger who are paying attention because it is preferentially saying, hey, young people, we don't care about your future. We're stealing from your future. We're giving it to people today. By the way, they all tend to be, they all tend to be kind of uh, in our socioeconomic bracket, right? Jerome Powell might be a very nice guy, worth a ton of money. Uh, he's also uh, probably bailing out uh, friends and family and all that other stuff too, and people he goes to parties with and all that. He's just, he's in a bubble. He just doesn't understand that this is the reality that people are living in. This is the reality people are living in. This is what it looks like on Main Street right here. And what can the Federal Reserve do about it? Not a lot. Uh, all they're going to do is... Uh, is just pump up stocks and do all of that. And they're creating, unfortunately, a huge, huge imbalance between rich and poor. So that, of course, is going to lead to these sorts of uh, conclusions here 
and people are starting to notice that, hey, this is all very unfair. And that it's that unfairness that fundamentally drives this uh, ailment of the republics. It's fundamentally a nice broad pyramid that's kind of low in shape with a wide base as a stable pyramid. One that's really, really, really tall, looks more like an obelisk, right? It's like really like skinny, narrow at the bottom, just a very, very few pointy people at the top is a not a very stable structure. Uh, okay. Hey, I was going to move on. By the way, I, I'm pretty much out of time here, so I'm going to just skip over this. You know what? I'll get to this tomorrow, but I was going to talk about this ridiculous Washington Post article, and I put air quotes around that. That's a super politicized thing and it politicizes medicine, but they got all the hydroxychloroquine data wrong, really, really, really wrong. So we'll talk about that uh, tomorrow because I I do want to get into that. So uh, you'll see a conclusion in here that I didn't quite get to. So conclusions. First, hey, uh, please help people hear our message and you can do this by A, sharing this link, uh, this link for this one to your friends subscribing to this channel, um, and or C, liking this episode. So subscribe and like it both. That would be a big help for us. And that way more people will get to hear it. And that would be the way you could help. The Federal Reserve is funneling vast wealth, transferring ownership of America to the already wealthy. I don't know what rationales they have for that, but that's the model they have in their head. I think it's dogmatic. I think it's ideologically rigid. And I think it's wrong. And I think it fundamentally lacks a whole lot of integrity. And uh, so that's uh, the Federal Reserve. That's my um, judging them at this point in history. This is clearly, it's terribly unfair. History's clear on this. Social instability will result. And that's what we're seeing here. You know, that's why we need a revolution. I mean, it's already uh, showing up in the young and showing up in in the poor and showing up all over the place. And so the Fed better get off of uh, this super unfair path it's on soon. So they lack integrity around all of this stuff, which is very, very unfortunate. Um, Integrity is what we need more than anything. If I read through the Washington Post piece, I would show you how they lacked integrity. So it's just time. It is time for you to be prepared for this new future that's coming. And it doesn't have to be this way. And it didn't have to be this way. It really didn't. There's we can we have so much more context for how to be, and we know that this isn't the way to go. That's that's clear. We know that just throwing money in uh, at the rich that isn't the way to go. So there's lots we could be doing, but unfortunately we're not doing it, which is why I'm going to ask you to uh, plant a garden, and as well watch this trailer. Go to this uh, URL right here peakprosperity.com slash WTF2, and you can watch um, that uh, that entire thing that we did here with uh, these wonderful people uh, on there, uh, myself included. So um, that would be something you could go and do. And, and all you need to do when you go there is you would uh, register. If you're already registered on our site, you just get to watch. If you're not, just put in your email and you will be good to go. And you can watch that WTF2 webinar. Uh, really good stuff. And plant a garden. You know why? Because the Fed's going to print and print and print until this whole thing breaks. And it's going to break again, just like it did in 2000. That was bad. Just like it broke in 2008, which was worse. This time it's going to break even more spectacularly. And with any luck, we come out of this saying, gosh, it's a bad idea to let dogmatic, ideologically rigid, conflict of interested sorts of people completely make decisions about how and where trillions of dollars are going to be funneled because we're going to discover just like the Soviets did having a small unelected committee of people deciding the correct prices for things is a bad idea. Uh, communism didn't work for uh, corn and uh, crop report uh, production and for steel production for the Soviets and central planning of prices doesn't work any better in, in a capitalist society either. And that's what we're going to discover, but not before things get a little bit bur- worse before they get better, which is why. You need to plant a garden. All right, everybody. That's all I got for today. We'll be back tomorrow. Thanks for listening. Bye-bye. WTF, What the Fed, round two. Last time we were together, we were very concerned because the Fed had added $200 billion to its balance sheet. Little did we know, a few weeks after we chatted, the coronavirus exploded across the world. And in response... The Fed and the world's central banks have now been printing trillions and trillions of dollars, making the magnitude that we were concerned about look positively quaint. Isn't it optically awful that Bernanke 
the past chairman went to join Citadel, which was one of the first entities to receive a bailout. What hasn't changed would be an easier question uh, because so much has changed at this point in time. One in five of the workforce in America has lost their job in the last six weeks and the market has gone up. We've had unemployment jump to 14.7% from 3.5% and the market has gone up. We've seen consumer credit and consumer spending collapse to all-time lows and the market has gone up. Every emergency effort to save the system makes it more fragile. The data is suggesting that there isn't any way out of this except to print the dollar into oblivion. They're picking the 0.1% and the 1% over everybody else again. This deflation will continue for a while, but then there's going to come a day where all of the currency printing comes back with a vengeance. We are now witnessing the death of this currency system.